Today's webinar is on reporting India to a global audience and we're featuring Vikas Pandey, who's a BBC India editor and an IHNM alumnus. He likes to explore the intersection between technology and storytelling. His VR films have won several awards, including the ABU Digital Content Award, the WAN, IFRA and Digipub. His films have been screened at several international festivals, including the CPH Docs at Copenhagen, Sheffield Docs Festival, and Adelaide Fringe. In this session, Vikas Pandey will talk about reporting India to the world. He'll give us an insight into the challenges that editors face while explaining local stories to audiences around the world, and share his knowledge about bringing innovation into legacy newsrooms. Hi, Vikas. Hi. Hi. Uh, before we get started, would you mind if I explain the format of the webinar to the participants here? No, absolutely. So the webinar will be a total of 60 minutes. We will take questions in the last 20. Please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask uh, questions to the speaker directly. In case you have issues with your mic, please feel free to input your questions in the chat box and the speaker will answer them. Thank you. We will get started now um, because you are with the BBC and um, you are given the responsibility of representing India and into the world. How challenging is it to explain complicated local stories to the wider world? Thank you, Sangeeta, for such a lovely uh, introduction. And the format is clear, but I just want to uh, request the participants that you don't have to wait for last 20 minutes to ask your question. I want it to be very conversational. So even when I'm finishing an answer or in between, you want to raise your hand and ask a question, please feel free to do that. Let's make it as conversational as possible. Uh, now going back to your question, it is extremely challenging, you know, because during your journalism training and even after that, uh, the way you are molded is to tell India's story to Indians, right? And that's how you come up. And when you walk into a global newsroom, that's the first thing that hits you. That the stories that you may think are super important, uh, but may not make sense to your editors in London, or wherever your uh, headquarters is. And that's not a challenge just for me, but all the reporters I speak to, whether it's New York Times, or Washington Post, all of us go through that. Um, and the challenge sometimes is that we will feel that the story is really important and sometimes the answer is not that warming from, from your headquarters and that makes you frustrated. Uh, just to give an example, when um, we started getting, you know, sense of that uh, uh, second COVID wave was coming, we wanted to do a bunch of stories. We had experts lined up, but because at the same time, the U Europe was flaring up, there wasn't much interest from headquarters that India seems to be calm, it's fine, it's on a downward trend. So why do an alarming story? So, and that's where the, uh, the key lies. How do you make people understand that what's happening in India could touch them too, or it's important for the world? So for example, uh, the second wave, right? Not only it was being discussed that it will come, but there was a lot of buzz around variants, right? A double mutant was announced. Uh, and there was also questions about India's capability to sequence, uh, just to clarify it by sequencing. I mean, uh, the labs are assigned to pick samples, uh, about 5% is what is needed from across India. And they have to crack open the genetic code of the virus. Basically, it's instruction manual to see if it has changed. Can it escape um, uh, uh, antibodies gotten from either vaccine or prior infection? And that's where we found a sweet spot. So we were able to tell that if a new variant emerges in India or the one you know, we call Delta now, it wasn't called Delta then, it was called the India variant, it could potentially take the world down. And that's where it hit the sweet spot and people got up and took notice. So, and then we were right. We started reporting it that this new variant and our coverage was very, very focused on variants because everyone else was reporting everything. So we got in touch with a lot of scientists from within the government, outside uh, experts around the world that how dangerous this variant could be. The other challenge was to, you know, break it down, as I said, calling it the instruction, instruction manual, how to simplify it and explain it to the world. And the moment we said, because at that time, travel was open between India and a lot of other countries, 
And the moment we put that line in that if this variant emerges across India, it could cause havoc across the world, which eventually happens. So this is just one example. You have to find links that could work for global audiences. And one of the things I tell my team is, if you are thinking about doing a story for a global audience that should also work for Indians, always think if the same story is placed in Brazil or, or any other you know, European country, would you be interested in reading it as an Indian? And if the answer is yes, then you should go ahead with that story. Uh, the other challenge that we face is, uh, you know, the terms that we often use. We are very used to, you know, using in Indian newsrooms that we don't bother to explain. Um, tiny, tiny things, which I'm sure you will learn in college and later on, you know, the, the difference is things like between FIR and nobody understands what an FIR is across the world. So that's the second thing that you always have to be watchful about terms that we are very used to in India. We instinctively pick, but people around the world don't get it. So, and, and the third and more, most important thing is caring about that story. If you really care that this is a story the world should know, and it does, I'm not just talking about COVID, it could be anything. It could be a human interest story. It could be a healthcare story. If you really care about the story and if you're passionate that people around the world should know about it, then you go ahead. So these are kind of two, three, you know, ballpark things that you keep in mind. And these are the challenges you face um, when you step into a global newsroom to tell the India story to the world. Thank you, Vikas. And um, how is it that you make these, so these stories? Um, how do you pick these stories? How do you know that these stories are the ones that will click, that will uh, that a global audience will relate to? Yeah, so that's a very contentious word, click. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are story at times we know people are going to click, but do they serve the purpose of journalism, right? And I think that's the challenge newsrooms across the world are going through. There are no straight answers for anyone, including for us at the BBC. So one example I'll give from yesterday, um, uh, when the story started breaking that Raj Kundra um, was named, you know, in, in, in a case about making pornographic films, uh, at that point, of course, it was trending, it was very high, but I had two simple questions, right? He was just named, he wasn't charged with anything. And the second bit I did not like was using Shilpa Shetty's name, because at that point there was, even now, there is no allegation against her. Uh, and as a newsroom, as an editor, I decided not to do that story because there wasn't enough. It was sensational. Yes, by evening, he was arrested. Um, and then we had enough to go with that story. So, you know, these kind of decisions you, you, you make every day. And if there's any supplementary question, guys, please, please ask. Yeah. If anybody in the audience has any question, please feel free to raise your hand or unmute your mic and ask. Um, if not, I'll just add a bit to you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you asked about taking day-to-day -day decisions. How do we decide? I'll go back to the same Brazil analogy that I gave. Why should people care about the story? So, like this morning, um, I mean, it came last night about zero survey, right? Now, the zero survey says two-thirds of Indians are you know immune. Uh, they had COVID and they have antibodies. Now, if you just do that story with that headline, it may or may not stick with people. They may not take notice, right? So how do we ensure that, you know, it's a big enough story and people around the world should read it? Now, one way of doing it, even if you think 60% of Indians are immune, still leaves 40%. And if you say 10% of vaccination, vaccinated people, that is still about 30, 35 to 40 million. And that's bigger than the population of so many European countries. So that's how you sell it. That, you know, even though two thirds of Indians are immune, according to the survey, but the vulnerable population, the size is still bigger than so many countries. And within that size, if the virus is again allowed to run through, the way we saw Delta variant, going back to my first answer, there could be potentially dangerous variants that can come because the more virus is allowed to spread, the more it mutates, right? So, so that's a way of telling a fairly local story to a global audience. So you make it relevant to people that you know, it, it matters. And then there are some stories that you don't have to try hard. They're just interesting you know, for, for, for anyone in India or across the world. So when you know, 
Mandira Bedi, the TV actress who was trolled because she cremated her husband. Now, honestly, even being a Hindu, even I had these questions, where does this belief come from? Right? Uh, is, it, is it scriptures or is it just, you know, old fashioned patriarchy or what is it? And then I asked somebody in the team to explore it and, you know, um, it didn't come out the way I wanted, but nevertheless, we did the story. Um, so you have to kind of keep an eye on these kind of angles, which will be interest, interesting to, for people um, across the world. You don't have to try hard and sell it. So kind of every day you have to make these decisions. There are some story that you just know they will work. You don't have to, you know, find a peg or, or, or try to sell it. And there are other stories you have to make sure that people around the world care for it. And as I, as I gave the zero survey example, the other example again I'll give is, um, you know, the health minister's statement yesterday about that there, there, there have been no oxygen related deaths in India. Now that statement touched or on uh, for a lot of people, right? In India. Now that's a story. Sorry, am I still around? Yes, Vikas, go ahead. We can uh, hear you. There's an update that just got followed you through it. Um, now, that's a story you don't even have to try hard to sell, right? It's about you just have to say that, you know, pick our past stories that we have reported on oxygen shortage and people dying outside hospitals and just put the minister's statement and see, but the BBC reported blah, blah, blah on XYZ dates. And that's a story if you lead with a human angle rather than minister said this. Flip it around and say the reaction that how people are seething based on the statement and the completely um, immature explanation that came later on that, uh, you know, the states did not give them data. So hence the statement. Um, just flip it around and all of a sudden you will see people clicking on it. So I'm personally not a huge fan of clickbait stories, but sometimes before even rejecting clickbait story, maybe there is an angle that you can pick. Right. Like, for example, Mandira Bedi's story, that day was quite clickbaity, and we decided not to do it on the day. We did it like a week or 10 days later with an angle. So when you're reporting to a global audience, these are the decisions you have to make. Uh, sometimes you have to stop your instinct to you know, just you know, steamroll into a story. You don't. You kind of step back and see why people will care across the world. You know, what is an angle I can pick? Uh, should we commission a film on it? Is it a big enough topic? So those are the decisions you have to make. And that's the difference between when you're reporting uh, within an Indian newsroom setup and a, a global newsroom that the pressure is the same, but you have a bit more time in a global newsroom to react to news stories. Is there also an issue of abundance? Because India does have breaking stories every day. And then as a reporter, you then have to prioritize and choose what you want to pursue. No, absolutely. I mean, um, I would say not too many. I think we have completely lost the meaning of uh, breaking news, so to speak. You know, everything is breaking news. Every minute is breaking news. Right. And it is hard, you know, honestly, if, if, if you are working in a place like um, Global Times, sorry, not Global Times, New York Times, and um, sorry, there was an alert from Global Times. So I just, <laughs> um, New York Times or the BBC or any global newsroom, um, you know, there is always a real estate problem. So I will explain what it is. So all these websites have a front page, right? And that's where stories from all regions drop in. And that is the landing page. When you open the BBC, that's where you go. There is an India page, but only people who know that the page exists or are interested in India will come there. So if you want, and this is same across board, you pick up any global broadcaster, it's the same. They have a landing homepage and then they have subsections. Now, the landing homepage is the priced real estate in any website, right? Uh, and it's the same for TV, it's the same for radio. You have flagship programs and then you have smaller programs. And if you want your story to be read by maximum number of people, that's where you want to be. Now, that brings me back to this breaking news. Now, because the real estate is small, there's a lot of competition. You have European desk, you have Latin America desk, you have Middle East desk, everyone is wanting to get a spot on that front page or in a prime prime time TV news slot or on a radio uh, program. Now, when you put that into a concept, breaking news, every minute uh, something is happening. 
And the answer is kind of, you know, rooted in the first question that we discussed. Again, you have to look at why should people care about this? You know, uh, you know, the prime minister holding an umbrella or, you know, um, prime minister meeting his, uh, you know, cabinet colleagues, uh, you know, every, everything like this is breaking news and maybe rightly so for, for, for domestic outlets. But let's say if you're in India and Brazilian president decides to meet his cabinet, would you be interested in reading that story? No, right? I mean, unless there's a big, you know, it's coming on the back of something. But if it's a general meeting, then you will not be interested in it, right? So it's very, very important to have that clear focus to filter breaking news. Uh, it gets annoying at, at, at times because, you know, you have set up these alerts and it's pinging throughout. Um, but the trick to report India to a global audience is, to not rely on breaking news so much, but to your own finding, to your original stories and, and doing takes, you know, people want to know if you're working for a broadcaster like New York Times or BBC, people in India and abroad want to know what BBC has to say about this or what New York Times has to, more about New York Times because they are more opinionated than us, but people are generally interested in knowing how these broadcasters cover a news story, whether it's big or, or, or small. So, it's important to filter that breaking news. And yeah, it comes with a bit of experience and training. And those of you who are here looking to join a college for journalism, you will be taught this in college. And when this class happens, hold it dear. If you have ambition of joining a, a global newsroom, pay a lot of attention, ask a lot of uh, questions to your professors about, you know, will this story that you're doing and in fact, there's a microcosm of, you know, when we study in college, particularly in IIJ, we have a newspaper and a TV bulletin you bring out. And I remember when we used to do that, there will always be the top story will be something that is happening at national. And we'll have stories from Kumbal Guru, this tiny village in where our college is, right? So kind of you start that training at the very beginning, you know, you're taking something which is happening maybe next door to your college, but why is it relevant to whole of Bangalore or Karnataka or sometimes even the country? So the same principle applies here. Why a fairly local story should matter to the world. So that's very important to remember. And that will be my advice to a lot of you. Pay attention if you have ambition of joining a global newsroom, how to identify things that people care beyond your target audiences. Thank you, Vikas. Another um, question that rises to me would be, what are the challenges that, what are the challenges you face while you're doing this reporting and writing? I, th I think if you have, if you've already identified the peg or how you're going to make people across the world care about this story, the most important challenge, especially when you're starting, it happened to me, it happens to every Indian journalist who, who starts with these um, global broadcasters, is about explaining. We, we assume a lot of knowledge, right, that people will have or readers will have. And, and that's how domestics cover it. And it's true as well. And I can, I can say, you know, so many examples, you know, we will just say RSS linked now, not the RSS feed, but, you know, BJP RSS. Um, sorry, the joke just fell flat completely. Um, so, you know, if you just say RSS link, people will not. And even if you expand it to say Rashtriya Swam Sevak Sangh, people will not understand. And you need those kind of explanations. It is the fountainhead of the ideology that the ruling party follows. Uh, similarly, if you're just talking about, you know, Ambedkar said this, you have to kind of put in that line that he was the founding father of India's constitution, he's one of the Dalit icons, and when you mention Dalit, again, you have to explain what Dalit is, because the caste system is not understood by people across the world. So, um, knowing what people may or may not understand outside India is super important. So, that is you know, the second challenge, first I talked about, which I've been, you know, the common thread in all my answers is knowing what will stick with global readers. The second challenge is identifying these things, being able to explain in clear terms what you mean. And our writing is full of, you know, colloquial terms. We use them, you know, freely in our copies in India. And they're fine at times, though I know professors don't like it, but it appears in newspapers nevertheless.
since I'm getting, I'm sure you know it. It's been teaching English there. Um, it 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 appears nevertheless no matter how many times professor tell it's not okay, um, and somehow you know even we scoff at it, but we understand it, right? So as professionals, you and I may not like it that why these terms we use when you can say the same thing in much simpler terms. But the bottom line is we understand it, right? So okay, we'll scoff it, move on. But if you write, you know, uh, uh, those very colloquial terms for a global audience, they will be at complete loss, you know. So knowing that what are those questions that you don't leave uh, unexplained things in the copies is, is the second challenge that, that you face when you're writing to a global audience. The, the third, third challenge you face is it's kind of a mundane thing, but it's very important is your picture selection. Now, if you're doing a story on COVID, um, you know, how many times you can use photos of a crying family, right? Now, the question is being typecast a lot that BBC reports India in a particular fashion. Not that those kind of allegations ever uh, influence your editorial decisions, but when, when you are uh, writing or even broadcasting to a global audience, what kind of pictures you use it's very important. And sometimes what happens, your colleagues who are not from India end up using those typical, you know, India images, so to speak. So it's very important to know even before you're writing what is going to be a lead image. If you're doing a TV package or a digital video, how you're going to tell them. I'll come to videos and, and things a bit later. But these are kind of two, three, uh, you know, broader things. I'll sum it up. Find a reason why people should care about your stories across the world. Watch out for things that you need to explain. Don't assume knowledge because even in India, people don't know everything and uh, about complicated terms. And outside India, it's even more. And third, look for additions to your story. That is your pictures, your captions, how are you going to write them? What picture is, is going to best represent your story? Thank you, Vikas. At this point, we have a question from Simran in the chat box. Simran, do you want to unmute and ask your question? If that's possible. Uh, yes, sure, ma'am. Yes, go ahead. Uh, hello, good morning, sir. Uh, you can call me Vikas, and I'm sure you'll be told this in college. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you're audible, Simran. Uh, yes, so, so like uh, I had this question in mind, like, as humans, we have biases. So how hard is it to maintain neutrality when it comes to reporting to a global audience? That's, that's a very important question. Um, and it's not just a global audience, but reporting for any kind of audiences. You know, neutrality is at the very core of what we do as journalists, right? Um, having said that, um, COVID is one story that has tested on this, this crucial journalistic rule that we are never supposed to break, right? Um, and I, I can only share my own example, how I was able to get over it. But before I get to that, I'll answer your questions first. Uh, it is hard. It is very hard. You know, I, I have reported from Afghanistan. I've reported near Syria. I've, I've seen a lot of, you know, unfortunately, um, a lot of bad things that I shouldn't have seen. And, you know, your human tendencies do kick in, right? But it's important to maintain, it's so important to maintain your neutrality. And we are living in a world where we all are very opinionated, right? We do get angry at things. We are all human beings. Even we are going to do a story about, you know, say a gruesome rape in UP. And I am very angry. I'm very angry with the way government has responded, the way officials are responding, denying justice even before uh, in the case can open. And, I'm just putting a disclaimer, it's an imaginary scenario. Um, but let's say I'm very angry and I decide to tweet it, right? I say, very aghast with the way officials are responding. It's a shame, which I would say a lot of journalists do, a lot. And it's become okay. But for us, and I'm sure again, you'll be taught this in college, it's not okay, why? Because you're already prejudicing your story, the one you're going to do, right? You've already put it out that you hate the government, you have opinions about it, and it's fine to have opinions. I'm not saying it's not. It's our job to keep it to ourselves and not let them filter into our copies. 
and lets you go to a uh, you know a state a particular location through some incident it happened you file a report and you ask some scathing questions right it will take just one tweet from someone to say oh look at this journalist she had already tweeted that she hates our chief minister and then your neutrality comes into question right so this is one example why it's so important to keep it to yourself so i think the difference you need to know we can't become robots right we are going to have opinions we are going to have feelings about stories but it's very very important to keep it to yourself and somehow channel that energy into you know if you're frustrated if you're angry about something channel that energy into doing your story as best as you can but never ever let your opinions come out right so that's kind of a thumb rule um i can give another example um i was in mazar e sharif in afghanistan and that's an area which is you know controlled by the northern alliance and very like people favor india there not pakistan so much so i had it easy to move about you know not much difficulty and um there was another team from another channel uh, this was when taliban was making inroads from 6 7 years ago in kunduz um and there were a lot of people from pakistan in that team and there was a lot of band there was friendly banter initially and then some locals joined it now we were doing a particular story that how mazar e sharif is becoming a cradle of sort of you know relatively uh, uh liberal views within the larger afghanistan context and that's where the blame game started that all the conservatism has come from pakistan right now it's very easy for me as an indian to jump into that and say yeah that's right right and somehow let that slip into my story but that i don't have any proof right you know there have been books written on it i can't put that in a 3 minute tv package or a digital video so it's very important to kind of be influence soak it all up from all around and make your informed opinion do get affected as human being that's absolutely fine but stop Uh, now I'll come to the second part when I talked about COVID. So that COVID story tested us, like, and it's kind of you know, I'm not sure. I'm you know, maybe journalism professors or researchers will look at this um, in the future that how we told these stories, what sort of roles we broke or adhered to. Um, the difference was you know when you are in Afghanistan, even if you're seeing bomb blasts and terror attacks, you know. or when i was covering mumbai attacks you kind of still separated from the story right it is it is hard you are get, getting affected you are seeing death and destruction around you you are seeing injustice being served you are seeing innocent people being targeted false cases and what not it affects you right but there is a degree of you know uh, detachment that you can still follow but when it came to covid people in your family your loved ones your neighbors your friends uh, struggling to get things struggling to get something as basic as oxygen and beds and that's why it's very hard very very hard to to to, to bring that uh, you know the line that i talked about how i did it and how a lot of my colleagues did it uh, you know we decided to tell stories from personal perspective some of them not all and the idea was very simple we're not going to let our anger slip in we just stick to this happened this happened this happened now there are questions on what could have happened could these people would have been saved so you ask those questions still but you still don't let your opinion slip in that i hate this government because my cousin died or my neighbor died you let experts ask those questions and you or you let facts speak uh, you know for themselves so sorry for this long answer but this is i think the most important thing when you're reporting for a global audience because your credibility is everything and there are people who are constantly at- attacking that credibility right so one wrong tweet one wrong instagram post and then your credibility will be questioned for years to come so yeah absolutely key to maintain your neutrality but having said that don't be a robot do have opinions do have feelings do get angry do get very angry at what you see around you but channel that energy into doing your story as good as you can simran i hope that answers your question and 
do you have yes any thank questions? you so much okay um does anybody else have questions at this point because that brings me to asking you how you think as a journalist we can function on social media because this is something that we've been trying we've been trying to tackle and teach our students also at IIT jain um you can't not exist on social media as a journalist right you have to ideally so how does one um bridge this divide no of course you have to exist because you know if you're not seen you're not known it's very simple Correct. you have to be i i i was like very reluctant initially i had a twitter account but that was just to look at what other people were writing i'll never tweet anything right and uh, it, it is important to be seen you know, on as many platforms as you can uh, because sadly you know uh, we are living in a world where if you're not seen you're not known no matter how good the work you do so you have you you know i'll be very blunt about it you have to do a bit of you know self promotion in the sense you have done a good story and if you want more people to read it you have to at the very minimum tweet the link of it right so yes the first first part of the answer is yes you have to be on social media there's no way of um, avoiding that not only you know promotion is just one tiny bit of it but just to know because you know social listening as we call it is very really important you have to see what people are talking about you have to see the kind of words they are using the kind of issues they are picking up so it's very important to be on social media now how how do we maintain that neutrality on social media it's very hard because the medium by nature is very fast you know something happened rajkumar arrested and it's very intimidating how shameful it is tweet done right or how shameful it is that bollywood a-listers are doing it and when you do that you miss a very tiny point that rajkundra is not the bollywood a-lister his wife is and at the moment his wife has nothing to do with the cases against him and you have ended up implicating her that the police hasn't right so it's very important what we call the fonzi moment you know if you want to tweet something out on a new story take a few moments ask am i accusing somebody without having any proof am i putting out something that may be factually incorrect have i done my due diligence i got this video could it be possibly true has somebody else tweeted about it or is it even important to tweet what difference is it going to make if i tweet it sometimes you know we just tweet it for the for the heck of it right or or put it on instagram or facebook or god knows so many other platforms so it's very important what am i contributing by tweeting this bit right and half the time you know well i don't really need to but everything else that i said in my um, answer to simran that same applies on social media as well so two or three things you have to just absolutely keep in mind any links forwards videos you're getting ask yourself could it be possibly true and what can i do to find more about it before i tweet it as any other verified journalist i mean don't even go by verified just somebody has a blue tick doesn't mean they are all going to tweet right things that rule is out of the window well and truly no earlier we used to say yeah but is it from a verified account no that that rule you can't follow anymore because you know a lot of blue tick people also end up sharing fake news sometimes i'm not so do your own due diligence as a journalist that you've been asked you know taught where this video could be from where this picture could be from who are the people in it can you find out more and you know sometimes if you're a journalist while doing that you may land a story as well something you would not have thought about if you just forwarded or tweeted that thing so that's rule number 1 ask those questions rule number 2 do i really need to am i adding to the noise is it is it going to change anything do anything to me or to people it's already viral do i really need to get into it and if you have if your answer is 50 50 then it's very simple don't third you're very angry about something and you want to express that anger but ask this question by expressing that anger are you compromising your neutrality because the person or the government or the official you are expressing your anger against what if you have to do a story about that person or that government or that ministry later on and could people come back to you or oh, you always hated this guy anyway so it's not surprising you're doing this story right so these these are kind of three rule of thumb you always ask yourself and if you have any doubt 
any doubt whatsoever don't tweet the temptation is you know uh, if you want to keep your twitter account ticking guys you know all of us like cricket right tweet about cricket tweet about football safe tweet about a film you really like have a debate you know if, if you like the iranian film or you know a film you watch which is not really popular on netflix talk about it if you i'm i'm saying this is not a general rule applies on everyone if you are genuinely interested in cricket football or cinema do that so find in 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 social media is very important to find your identity don't be one among the noise right find your identity oh this is a guy who gets really good tips on uh, on 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 good cinema you know he tells us what to watch on netflix you know and if you're a journalist find things you know uh, films that are based on journalism based on journalists or just you know good storytelling things that you can pick while doing your own work or if you're a sports buff write about that so find that identity on social media because half the time when i talk to my younger colleagues they end up tweeting oh i tweeted because i had not tweeted anything for a week my page was looking stale so i had to tweet something and everyone was talking about it so i tweeted right so if you have that problem that your page is looking stale find something that you were interested in and you generally have a lot of knowledge to share with people do that thank you vikas um i'm i'm thinking it's not just about tweeting as well it's also about the kind of tweets you retweet right because yeah. on twitter it's uh, not just your opinion the minute you retweet it is taken as you endorsing whatever you're retweeting same rules so, apply to, yeah. to to retweets as well to sharing of video these rule of thumb apply to anything you do on social media even if you're commenting on someone's post right right anything you know you so much so you write a letter remember these three four rules have been talking about it. and they will look they're old fashion right they don't sound amazing they're like you know why are these people keep repeating you know and everyone is writing about everything but if you want to have a long career in journalism you want to have that credibility it's very important because tweets and all have a funny way of you know resurfacing exactly and and i can share my own example you know uh, when i started writing a lot uh, i didn't realize i used to have a blog you know maybe god maybe 10 years ago and there were things i had written as a very much journalist and i had to go and take it down right so everything on the internet has a funny way of coming back to you so why create something that you know if you're, we you know we did it because social media media wasn't as viral when we were started there were worrying signs even then but it wasn't as viral it wasn't as you know poisonous as it is now so don't make that mistake you're starting out you have a clean slate don't have something that can come back to haunt you later might as well start out uh, being more mindful right at the start absolutely yes thank you vikas um we we touched upon the subject earlier where you spoke about video um storytelling and do you want to talk to us about it yes so um yeah video storytelling or i generally you know to encapsulate the word i been use is innovation and and it's very close to my heart because as a young journalist when you walk in uh you know you can be brimming with ideas and you want to do new things and it can be quite heartbreaking because the first answer 9 out of 10 times is going to be no can't do doesn't make sense right and you can't blame people who give those answers because sometimes they may not be aware of right? so you know if you join an indian newsroom or a global newsroom and you're a young journalist brimming with ideas you want to change things not change things in society but you know maybe how stories are written how videos are done why innovation is important and what is the right way to go about it in legacy newsroom i'll just briefly touch upon it because it's very important why it is important so let's say you walk into a newsroom and it's very set in ways you know in its ways the way things are done and you want to cause some tiny disruptions you want to throw in some new ideas now two things can happen be assured that you will be rejected the first time for sure right but i'll just give you two three tips how you can persevere and maybe get to your ideas and don't be afraid of failure as in when you find success and if you are in a large organization that becomes your identity very quickly that this guy thinks on feet or this 
or he or she can come up with fresh ideas very quickly or things we don't have an eye on, uh, those kind of things. So to all young journalists in this chat, uh, don't go steaming with ideas on your day one, spend a few years maybe or months at least and keep thinking about, you know, how I can bring innovation. And when I say innovation, it's a very broad term. It could be something as simple as how, what is the right way of writing a story? What is the right way of bringing video? What are the new formats we can, we can, we can um, think about doing, right? So it could be anything. So I'll give a couple of examples in all three and tell my story how I did it. So like now it was easy for me as I had the team, I have restricted the word limit of news articles to 400 words strictly because our news are, it's not an innovation, but I will call it an intervention because the data was constantly telling us people don't want to read um, long news stories. Features are separate. If it's interesting, people still read 1,000, 1,200 words, but if it's a news story, people don't want to read more than that. But our news stories, because if you know, the first thing I talked about was explanation of you know, terms and it, it was getting longer. Now the immediate reaction was no, everybody across the board. Now, when you approach an editor with an idea, don't just go, I have this idea, it's brilliant. Always think about the outcome, right? So you have to get a buy-in from your editor. Say, I'm thinking of doing a thing like this. And if we do it like this, this is how the success is going to look like. And the moment you are going to be able to convince your editor that we, we are all going to share the success, you will see interest you know, coming slowly. So it's very important, don't go with just ideas. Be ready to explain, if you implement a idea, how it's gonna look like in the longer run, what success is going to look like and how the newsroom is going to benefit at large. So um, I'll just give my, one of the things that I did in 2017, I, um, had applied for a fellowship to research VR, funny enough, for um, health journalism. It was a very funny idea, we were, even before COVID, because I felt that a lot of journalists, you know, a lot of newsrooms didn't even have health as a beat. But if, uh, you know, VR could be used to train up journalists in smaller towns and cities where they're thrown into scenarios, real life scenarios, anyway, I won't go into detail. Um, and I didn't get the scholarship. But it kind of sparked an interest, right? And I went back to the BBC that, you know, this is an upcoming medium and you should do something about it. It's a, it's a powerful, um, you know, medium of storytelling. First question, well, a lot of people don't have headsets, right? We have headsets, how are people going to consume? Well, the answer was both YouTube and Facebook are supporting it, but that's not a fuller experience. You don't immerse yourself. Then I said, look, as, as a legacy newsroom, we always don't do everything that reaches, you know, we do Doctor Who and we do Sherlock, right? That reaches masses, but we also do science programs that, you know, the audience size is very small. So the analogy I, I used was that, you know, people spend a lot of money on modern art, right? But masses don't see it, but it has its place. So now I could have gone two ways. I know this is a great future. We are just going to just explode and everyone will be consuming news and videos in VR. Or I can say, well, it will bring us a lot of recognition it will kind of open a new way of storytelling and who knows where it could lead, you know? And we all know the way we are consuming news today, we, are not, we were not consuming five years ago. So who knows 10 years down the line, we may not even have mobile phone. And this is my belief that we'll all have wearable devices. We will not be carrying something. I'm dead sure about it. Uh, Kanchan Mam is going to scoff at that. Um, but, yeah, I, sorry, ma'am, I, I firmly believe that we are not going to be carrying these devices. Um, we'll, we'll be wearing tech in what shape and form, I don't know yet. So then formats will also change. So it's important to keep an eye on technology of today, what's emerging. So I'd just like to show a couple of quick examples. I'll be sharing my screens. How much time? We have 10 minutes, right? Yes. Okay. And then I'll briefly talk about these examples, right? You see my screen? Yes, we see the... So, right, uh, this is a story from Hyderabad. I'll just explain it a bit. So, you know, farm suicides, farmer suicides, sorry, uh, sadly have become page three, page five stories. You know, we often see 20 farmers killing themselves in Vidarbha and Maharashtra becoming a page six story, right? 
And this used to trouble me a lot. So I was thinking, how what can we do that, that you know, people get up and take notice, both in the international market and in India as well. And we toiled with the idea of doing a documentary, doing a long feature. And I said, what if we recreate somebody's life, a family who's been affected because of this, in their own voice? Now, the problem is, if you do a traditional documentary, you're not going to find footage to recreate that, right? And if you just do animation in 2D, it may look cartoonish, right? So we decided to uh, do uh, a film, put in VR, and in this, an artist drew the entire story. It took six months inside the VR set. Sorry, too technical. I just played. Uh, having said that, I'll share my email ID at the end of the chat. Uh, if anybody is interested in more about technology, VR, how this particular film is done, uh, do get in touch with me. I'll be more than happy to share tips and ideas. Can you hear audio? Yes, because we can hear the audio. Okay. Appa, I was your youngest daughter. And I miss you a lot. I'm 25 years old now, but I still feel like your little daughter. There is so much I want to tell you and there are so many memories that came rushing to my mind when I heard that you had left this world. I remember that you always treated me specially because I was physically weaker than my brothers and sisters. I remember watching my mother and other sisters going to the fields to work. But you had a different future planned for me. You wanted me to study and get a job. You carried the burden of our family. Family on your shoulders over the decades. You hit it all. You never let us know the extent of struggles you were going through. I'm just forwarding because it's a lot. When I was around five years old, Fine. you let me come to the fields with you. I loved holding your hand and walking with you. I remember that pulses peanuts and castor seeds would grow in our fields in a beautiful land of Anandpur district in Andhra Pradesh state. I used to bring lunch. Dice? I am just going to the end. continue to farm? Yeah, that's... What is the point of it all? Why doesn't the government do something for us so no farmer dies? Thousands of farmers, including you, are just too many precious lives that we have lost because of drought and apathy. I miss you, Appa. sharing my screen now so this is just one example i had planned to show you a lot more but we have run out of time i'll paste links here so this is just one of the films it won a lot of awards i'm not self-promoting but just to give an example so it doesn't have to be vr it it's somehow i got attracted to it but it could be anything so when you're in a newsroom do your beats whatever you are assigned to but find something that's special something that you can change now, in legacy newsroom, it's always going to be a tough ask because people are set in their ways and how they do things. And, you know, change is a hard thing to bring in. But I said, 
uh, as I said earlier, it's important to bring your editor or people who hold budgets and money because you can't do that without it. You know, make them a participant that if we do that, it could lead to change. It could bring us more recognition. Sometimes you may not be given money, right? Sometimes you may not be given time. It's hard. Like the first time I did it, the first film, I did it entirely in my own time. And one good thing about India is there are a lot of, you know, independent studios. If you're looking at technology, but it could be anything. There are a lot of collaborators you can find, you know, young people who are good with A or B craft and are looking, you know, to collaborate with someone. So it's not always, you know, about you need to have pockets full of money to do something different. You can do it if you find right people around you. There are enough documentary filmmakers, good editors, good sound engineers, good VR and whatnot. You know, the world is really your oyster. So it's very important when you are in a newsroom and change and innovation is something that appeals to you. Find that little corner for yourself. Find that little expertise for yourself, which is beyond your beat. You could be, you know, uh, you know, take a liking for sports journalism, business, politics, whatever that may be. But within that ambit, find something that sparkle, you know, that will make you shine later. And for me, it was VR and it led to, you know, opening of an entire VR department and we did several films and, you know, and, and inspired a lot of other people to come up with new ways. We, you know, I mean, it will get technical, but we learned from it that we were making these films. But, you know, it's not as impactful when you're watching as you saw on YouTube because I have to constantly scroll around. If you're watching in a headset, uh, a lot of people, you know, took their headset off in one of the film festivals. Almost everyone was crying because the story was so emotional. Uh, but we learned and then we thought, okay, how could we use the same technology and the same pipeline, but make a 2D product, right? I'll quickly actually give you a glimpse of how that could look. Is it okay if I share my screen again? Yes, please go ahead with us. So this is a film about uh, Barley Tibe in Maharashtra. So basically when the bullet train project was around, uh, announced, it's cutting through the Western Ghats in Maharashtra. And... Uh, the tribe that has traditionally cultivated those lands and lived there for, for, for centuries, really. Um, they were told, you know, you can't take compensation. First, they didn't want any compensation because they didn't want to leave their ancestral land. And second, none of them had any papers. How are they going to prove? Because this, you know, parcels of lands have been just passed on to them from their ancestors. So, so the idea was how do we, you know, and I'm sure you all have heard about Warli art, right? You've seen those ticket figures. And it's has been changed so much. People have used to make clothes and art and sold them for millions across the world. But the tribe that actually makes it gets nothing. And the traditional Wali is very pure. It has no color. It's made with uh, uh, rice flour. It's done with fingers. There's no brush involved. But, you know, a lot many people don't know that. So we just thought, okay, what if we ask? And the peculiar thing is like a lot of tribes in India, they don't have a script. So they pass their stories from one generation to another through cave paintings. And the paintings are very elaborate. If you've been to Mumbai airport, you'll see the guy who's painting in this film. One of his works is there. It's very elaborate, this full story in one frame. And then we thought, okay, how do we ask this person? You know, What if we ask him to marry technology with his storytelling and painting? And he did that and the outcome was fantastic. And in the end, he says he, he agreed to give VR a try, not because they're against change, they just want to be able to make their own decisions. Change should not be imposed on them, right? Close to nature, fields, our trees, and our way of life. I want to tell you how we got to this point. Once again, through art, but this time in virtual reality. It is near the Surya River, surrounded by hills and jungles. When someone starts playing the tarpa, everyone comes out. We all forget how tired we are. And on special occasions like the harvest or during weddings, the married women in our community draw special designs called Dev Chok. That's where the art of worldly paintings began. It was, in fact, my mother who taught me how to draw. Worldly paintings are thousands of years old. We mainly use white paint and line drawings. 
That's how it's been for centuries. But people are now using it for commercial purposes. Right, so in the difference between the first film and this is that where I had to scroll around to show you the fuller picture, but in this is quite immersive in a 2D screen, you're watching as it is. Now, again, as I said, this doesn't need to be your mainstream work, right? You can do like you know, modern art sitting with the larger art world of cinema, literature, everything. It has a place, it's not mass. But what it does is it makes you a specialist into something. So innovation is key. Also because, you know, you don't end up doing that people have been doing for years anyway, and you also spend next 10 years doing the same, which you will do anyway. But within that, if you can find that sparkle, find that something special that you bring to the table, uh, you will be very, very employable. You will make a name in the industry much, much faster than others. So it's very important to keep an eye in a newsroom. What different can you do? Thank you, Vikas. Uh, the second film was very, like you said, extremely more, more immersive than the first one since yeah. you had to scroll through. I'm sure if we were to watch it ourselves, it would be a little... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anybody, does anybody have questions at this point? Would anybody want to input your questions or unmute and ask? Because... All right, Rikas, um, since we don't seem to have any questions, uh, you can send us your email ID and the links and we will sure. forward it to the... Sure, hang on for a second. I will yeah. Write it here. Uh, in subject line, if you're sending me a question, can you please write uh, IIJNM? So it yeah. will get lost. Right, and this is the Worley film link that I was just showing you. Here's another one to watch. And if you have any specific questions about these, I'll be there are plenty more, but these two should be enough to get you started. Thank you. Spark Thank you. Yes. Oh, we did well with time. Yes, so this brings us to an end um, of the IHNM webinar series as well for 2021. Um, thank you for showing us the intricacies of reporting India to a global audience and emphasizing the importance of neutrality and not assuming knowledge on part of the global audience when you're writing for them. It was an extremely um, educational session. Um, thank you for showing us new ways to use technology to improve the impact of stories and to uh, get better at storytelling. I'm sure we learned a lot. It was great having you here, at least digitally. We hope to communicate and collaborate more in the future. Thank you, Vikas. Thanks for everybody uh, for attending. I hope to see you in other sessions that we conduct throughout the year.